I want to talk about climate change, disturbance and forest management, and will extend a bit the perspective of Martin given in the previous talk. Uh, the first, when you when you are trained as a forest in Central Europe, maybe you have also learned as I that intemperate forest disturbance is not a big topic. This is something of the boreal forest with these huge fires and so on. Uh, during the last decades, we learned more and more about disturbance in temperate forests. For some, this was a catastrophe. For others, it was a surprise or interesting journey. Here you see a study a, combi uh, a paired study just in temperate forest on natural disturbance and management by Andrea Sommerfeld. And the interesting thing was, yes, there are a numbers of disturbance uh, if with effects of a dieback of trees. And on the other hand, in most uh, situation, uh, management makes the areas more pronounced, larger and so on. The next point is uh, in discussion on disturbance, we are uh, in discussion on con the right way of conservation forests. In this study already shown, the, for me, the most fascinating graph is in the supplement, showing that there was no difference between protected area and managed forests uh, in changes of species over time. But there was a clearly positive effect by in managed forests, which suffered from tree mortality. So the dieback in the forest seems to be not too bad for some of the organism. And this is the point I want to go more in details now. Why can we see that? And uh, to be honest, this shouldn't be a surprise for all those uh, trained in ecology. And there is a similar uh, figure like that was painted by uh, Wolfgang Schatzinger decades ago about the richness in the different development phases. And this was repainted based now on data by Torben Hilmers and extended by the fungi. And you see that for plants and animals, there's a high diversity in these early succession phases. Similar as we see in the late succession phases in these terminal decay phases. So there is no wonder that the conservationists are highly interested in the, on the right side of this graph. But to be honest, there are not such forests in Central Europe left. So when conservationists end up with protecting some areas, they get some of the areas of the faces in this center of this red, uh, uh, in this red area, where we have these optimal faces. And these are in fact, the, those with the lowest diversity over the three groups. When we go to the national inventory in Germany, we see exactly this lack of gap phases. These are very coarse analysis because the data are not perfectly suitable for that, but they give a good impression about the dominance of these um, optimum phases in our forests nowadays, which easily explain the rareness of many species in our forests nowadays. So now we turn to the other perspective. Now we come to the disturbance and this was a paper by my colleague uh, Burkhard Beudert, where he showed across 19 taxa that uh, when we take when we go on the alpha diversity level, uh, all those with a brown dot show a significant positive response to the bark beetle to Ipstebographus. So the promotion by the National Park Hearts, Ich schaffe Wildnis, with Borki the Borkenkäfer was in fact true. But even this is still not acceptable by some decision maker or politics. So it was forbidden. And this is also true for the red list species. When it comes to the disturbance, the common uh, reaction of people is to clean up, to make it clear, safe, uh, remove everything. And now more and more studies show, this is an overview of different kind of studies, how salvage logging, this removal after, of trees after disturbance has negative effect on different functions, species, populations, diversity, and so on. And uh, Simon Torn uh, uh, conducted a meta-analysis across all groups. And of course you have winners and losers after cleaning up such an area. Some are favored by your tracks from the machines and others are disfavored by the loss of the resource wood. But cleaning up is the common measure we use in most forests. 
Simon just uh, created a, a method, a new method, how to estimate uh, what, what do we gain and lose when we remove. And what, what we see, this is an analysis across all different types of, of taxa uh, across the world. And if you want to keep 90% of the original species richness typical for these unmanaged forests in a landscape, coming again to this gamma story, a gamma diversity driven by managed and, and salvaged and unsalvaged areas, you have to retain more than 70% of the area unlocked. When we go down to some uh, more famous uh, single species, there was this, is this story I want to tell you about Peltis grossa. The species is a Urwald relict uh, indicator of old growth forests. This is a picture from 100 years ago when the species still occurred in the area of the National Park Bavarian Forest. At that time, it was no national park, but you see old dead trees were there. Then between 1900 and 1950, modern forestry developed a clean strategy, removed the dead trees, increased the amount of spruce plantations, and the species went to extinction. The, the question was always, can it return from forever? And uh, we were uncertain. There were some rumors that the species is still around in the region, not in, on German side, but on Czech side but really proofs were, uh, were not existing. And then two years ago, colleagues uh, recorded from an area of 30 kilometers apart from our national park, it is still there and now it's quite common. And what we see there, this is the border between Czech Republic and Germany. On the left side is Germany, on the right side is Czech Republic, the national park with the unmanaged area. The, the, the species is now quite common there. But the density is, a, is 20 uh, times higher in the unmanaged side than on the left side in the salvage locked areas. So what I want to say with that is there are options that these large scale disturbances create such a resource pulse that even very rare species can build up population and recover in uh, in new areas or, um, or previous areas. The question is then what makes the temperature in this? This is what all I showed before was an indirect effect of global uh, change or global warming. We analyzed once the, uh, the interplay between deadwood resources and temperature. And on the left side, you see the effect that if you are under warm conditions, uh, species do not require that much dead wood than under cold conditions. So it means that if it gets warmer, they are they can ex um, they can exhaust better the resources. And this is also uh, fully supported by a recent analysis we conducted with Malay straps from large cities to heavy used agricultural to uh, natural landscapes and in forests in settlements and in meadows and arable fields. And of course, uh, the, the land use has a clear effect on the biomass, but the temperature was always linear positive on biomass, OTU richness, this is across all insects and even on red list species. So in our temperate zone, we have to assume that the, the ongoing increase in temperature will be positive for many populations. This brings me to my conclusions. Climate change is increasingly stressing trees. The tree dieback generates a strong immediate concern in people and a perceived need for restoration. But their occurrence and the subsequent management may or not constitute a natural form of restoration of less perceived long-term ecosystem stages harbor many threatened species. Be aware of that. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Jörg, for this very interesting presentation and also to be perfectly on time. 
So the floor is open for questions. There is already the first one coming in from Bertrand Montuir from Boilandry. This is also a case study in our book. And he asks, uh, speaking about disturbances, I did not hear about influences of game on regeneration, but also on floral species diversity. What is your opinion, Jörg? Shouldn't we focus on game control also to promote biodiversity? I think the, this question is uh, very well answered from the colleagues uh, from colleagues from France. Uh, as far as I know, th there is one study two years ago. It's the best one uh, investigating the effect of game by an exclusion experiment across the whole country, and the finding. It brings together the, the, on a first glance, controversial perspective of some conservationists and forest managers, because in general, there's a clear trend, and this is also existing over the, uh, globally, that uh, herbiv uh, the, the ungulates uh, increase the diversity of herbs, herb diversity, but decrease the diversity of shrubs and trees. Foresters are interested in shrubs and trees, or mostly in trees. Uh, some conservationists are more interested in herbs. Therefore, there is no uh, uniform answer to that. Uh, so ungulates can have positive and negative effect on plant diversity. It depends on the group we are looking for. Uh, when we go to, to Germans' uh, recent dieback of forests and the hope that we ha will have more mixed forest there, which means trees and shrubs, then the answer is clear, build a fence or shoot down the road years. That's it. Okay, thank you for this pragmatic uh, approach. Jörg, there is another question from an anonymous uh, listener. He says, you have an enormous experience with bark beetle infestations and dying spruce or dead spruce. One question is, how long do the dead trees stay and when do they break? And if they break, they can be a danger for, for visitors, of course, of, of the forest. And he asked also as a second question, what is your experience to this? How to deal with this increasing, let's say, danger for the forest visitors? Yeah, this is the most, probably the most common question I have been asked during the last year by different people, <laughs> because more and more people experience this uh, situation. In fact, it depends from a bit from the climate, of course, but the, the trees are standing there as a whole, more or less whole tree for, let's say, uh, eight, nine, ten years, and then they start to break down uh, in different heights. When they, have, when they are broken the first time, then they are not a danger for the tourists. Um, if the, you have the trees along uh, trails where you invite the people, you have to do some management uh, things to cut down the trees there along the trail to go in the area this is our most common uh, research area i would not say it's a danger so we walk there all the time and it's much more people are killed by car than ever by a tree which does not mean that the tree cannot kill people uh, but the probability is very low particularly even uh, particularly when you walk there um, uh, during not during windy uh, conditions, but our our suggestion to managers is because managers are interested. When can I plant in this area? And there are several arguments to plant immediately after the dieback because then the trees are still stable, and the competition between young trees planted and other um, other herbs uh, or shrubs is lowest. I hope I could answer in that way. <laughs>